Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, this morning to look at Joshua chapters 12 to 21. My name's Paul. I'm one of the student ministers here at Wild Street. Um, let me pray before we look at this passage together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we pray that as we hear your word today, we wouldn't harden our hearts towards you. Strengthen our faith as we come to know you as the God whose promises never fail. Amen. Uh, in our home, uh, there was a time when we tried recipes for healthy desserts. These recipes promised to give the equivalent pleasure and joy of real desserts. Um, but let's be honest, there has not been one recipe of a healthy dessert that has delivered the goods. Um, we don't believe in healthy desserts anymore. Failed promises can be really painful. Uh, I had a friend who didn't believe in marriage. Seeing so many failed marriages, he resorted to a promiscuous lifestyle. Because what if the marriage didn't deliver the goods? This way, he has control over when to begin and end a relationship. This same friend also found it hard to believe in God. Uh, he feared that after becoming a Christian, he would come to realise that it just wasn't worth it, that trusting God was all a big mistake, that his old life was so much better. It's like he had a fear of being tricked into receiving something he never asked for or wanted. Let's call it the fear of being duped. This fear that my friend had isn't unfamiliar to what goes on in my mind or the minds of any of us, I think. I wonder how much of our decisions, commitments, desires, thoughts and actions are driven by the fears that we have. Over the last few weeks, we've heard the narrative of the nation of Israel finally being led into their promised land. Miracle after miracle, we've seen how God handed over the land and drove out their enemies for them. So that where we ended last week, Israel was watching the dust settle from the war. Chapter 11, verse 23 says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. God promised them rest in a land of their own, and here it is, right in front of them. Has he given them exactly what he promised, though? What will it be like to live here? Will it be better than living as slaves in Egypt? Will they miss Egypt? There are a number of ways that the Israelites could have responded to all that God had done for them up to this point. And as we look through Joshua chapters 12 to 21 today, in amongst all the names, lists, and geographic locations that we find in it, we're going to focus on two examples of just how Israel received the inheritance that God promised them. The tension in waiting for God's promise to come through is resolved right here in these chapters. We might expect that this resolution would be some kind of celebration, a big party with lots of BC-style historic dance moves. No, not a party. A report is what we get. The resolution looks more like a report, detailing every aspect of the fulfilment of God's promises and how this fulfilment was being received by the people. And if we do a quick sweep over the 10 chapters, the repeating patterns show us that Joshua, Eleazar, the priest, and one chief from each tribe who were together divided the inheritances to each tribe according to what the Lord God had commanded. Reading through Joshua chapters 12 to 21 feels like reading through the minutes of a historic annual general meeting, detailing the portions of land that belong to each tribe. On the surface, it seems really boring, and it's, and it's easy to only see a bunch of names that we can't pronounce and lose sight of why this detail is in our Bibles. 
we come to see that these chapters are showing us the extent of God fulfilling his promise. The text is showing us how much rest God has gave his people. It's indicating the completeness of God's promise. Chapter 21 ends with the words, all came to pass. Every one of God's good promises all came to pass. So with all this in mind, let's read uh, the summary again that we find at the beginning of chapter 14. So if you turn there with me from verse 1. These are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one-half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and one-half tribes beyond the Jordan. But to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in with the pasture lands for their livestock and their substance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses, they allotted the land. This gives us a general feel of the content of these chapters. And if we have a look at the map that comes on the screen, this helps us see that the Reubenites, uh, Gadites and half tribe of of Manasseh are the two and one half tribes who had already uh, settled in the east of the Jordan River before the nation crossed over Jericho. That's shaded in the red. And from here on, uh, the focus is on the green shade there, uh, on the west of the Jordan, uh, where we see the nine and one half tribes receive their inheritances. The patterns of lists and geographic locations are broken by dialogues as a few of the tribes approach Joshua, each of them coming with a request. The first of these dialogues happens in verse 6 of chapter 14, when Caleb approached Joshua. Forty years earlier, Caleb was sent uh, with Joshua and ten other men to spy out the promised land, and he recounts the event to Joshua here in verse 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I promise, uh, and I brought him a word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. Caleb and Joshua trusted that even though the inhabitants of Canaan were terrifying and so much stronger than them, they weren't afraid because God was with Israel. But the other three men, they brought, uh, ten men, sorry, uh, brought fear among the people and lacked faith in God's power and goodness. Verse 9 says that Caleb was promised an inheritance because he wholly followed the Lord. Uh, as, as Moses promised him. And here he is at 84 years of age, verse 12, saying, So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Caleb approaches Joshua with confidence. But it seems a little bit presuming, don't you think? A bit too forward and maybe overconfident of him. This was something that Moses promised him 40 years ago. Caleb's now 84. Does he really think he can go and take a fortified city? The result in Joshua 15 verse 13 is surprising. According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave to Caleb the son of Jephunneh a portion among the people of Judah. Not only did Caleb receive the land, but he also successfully drove out the enemies there. This man is amazing. 
What is it about the faith of Caleb that is so inspiring, though? He seems like someone with limitless determination. Nothing scares a man like Caleb. He reminds me of Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Always there, somehow, to help Frodo on his journey. Everybody wants to have a faith like Caleb. But it would be a shame if we looked at Caleb's faith in awe, but failed to see what his, prom- what his faith is grounded in. What's inspiring about the faith of Caleb isn't how much faith he had, but that his faith was so grounded in God's word to him that there was no reason why he should be afraid. Caleb wasn't unfailing or necessarily fearless, But God's word is unfailing. Caleb succeeded because he held fast to God's unfailing word. God's unfailing word produced an eagerness in him to act on the promise and receive his sure inheritance. Have you met Christians do this in our day? I'm sure sure there are many. But an example I can think of um, is a, a pastor and his wife who remained in Syria during the recent war, even though they had many opportunities to leave. They endured much danger and hardship. But what moved their decision other than to lay aside their own life for the sake of the gospel? knowing that even though there's so much more they could gain in this life here and now, God has promised them something unimaginably better. Is our Christian faith grounded in God's unfailing word? Is God's unfailing word what moves us in our decisions and commitments? Is it what drives how we do relationships? Is God's unfailing word what shapes our desires? Or is it our fears that do all that? Are we more like the tribe of Ephraim? Ephraim had a very different approach to receiving their inheritance. They came up to Joshua with a complaint. Chapter 17, verse 14. Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance? Although I'm a, I'm a new, numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. They're concerned, perhaps worried that they've been duped. And they've come not to receive their inheritance, but to express that they, they deserve better. Maybe even insinuating that if God was so kind to bless them, they, they try by making them numerous, Well, he can bless them with a bigger piece of land then. When Joshua responds, suggesting that they go into the forest and take the land, they're not impressed with his suggestion either. Uh, Reason being that the Canaanites in the hill country have chariots of iron. Verse 16. Notice the contrast between Caleb and Ephraim. Caleb acted on God's promise to him by faith. But Ephraim's faith is looking more like fear and doubt. Not only a fear of the Canaanites, which seems so odd, considering they've just had a significant series of victories, but a fear that God's word is likely to fail. They doubted God and his word. They don't believe God's promise. I don't think we have to dig too far to find the same kind of fear in ourselves, the kind of fear that leads us to doubt God and his goodness. Adam and Eve, uh, fear, uh, Adam and Eve feared that God tricked them. They chose to believe a lie rather than God's word. This fear led them to sin and be cast out of the garden. Sin entered the world the moment humans doubted God's goodness. The Ephraimites should have known better. 
their own parents, the whole previous generation of the Israelites, apart from Joshua and Caleb, all died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. This interaction with Ephraim sees Joshua calling an assembly of all the Israelites in the city called Shiloh. Uh, We read in chapter 18, verse 3, that's when he addresses them saying, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? So giving them specific instructions, he helps the tribes take initiative and begin to act on the promise to strive to receive their inheritance. At the end of all the reporting of land divisions, uh, we read these closing words, end of chapter 21. Thus the Lord God gave to Israel all the land he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given them all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. These ought to be comforting words to to us, for us. Not one failed promise. Our God always keeps his promises. The detailed report in these 10 chapters boasts of the completeness of every promise that God made to Israel. A completeness that is described as rest on every side. But what's so significant about this rest? They did in fact have rest from their enemies for a time. They enjoyed God's blessing in the land. But this wasn't the end of the story. God had a bigger plan for his people. Remember the first time God's people had rest on every side in the Garden of Eden? When God made the world, he created it in six days. And when he completed his work of creation, he rested on the seventh day. And Adam and Eve enjoyed this rest with him. The writer of Hebrews uh, points us to this rest called the Sabbath rest. He says in Hebrews 4 verse 8, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did for his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Just as God rested when he completed his work of creation, God's unfailing promise is that we will receive our rest. The exact day of receiving our rest isn't the focus here. Uh, The focus is on whether we are eager to enter that rest. So eager to enter that rest that we hold fast to his son, Jesus. There are many days when I'm more likely to hold fast to the failing promises of this world. Our world promises endless pleasure. It promises a long, immortal life He promises an invincible body. He promises superior knowledge and wisdom. He promises success. If only we tried harder, if only we worked harder or smarter to get more money and just reach our rest. But this world, as it is now, is not our inheritance. That's good news, I think. God's unfailing word tells us that this world is going to pass away. It is only by faith in Jesus' death and resurrection that we receive an inheritance that does not pass away. 
We've been promised this by a promise-keeping God. There's no reason why we should fear, but only to act on this promise with confidence and strive to receive our inheritance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you know our hearts and how quick we are to be deceived to think that we can run life without you, that we know best. Often coming to you like sceptics, wondering if you actually love us or care for us. And yet you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for our sins and you offered us an eternal rest through faith in him. Please forgive us and help us see how depraved we are and how much we need you. Help us trust in your Son and all that he accomplished for us. And in his name we pray. Amen.